everyone. Thanks for tuning in to Test 2 Plus again today. I am Trace, and this is episode 3 of 5 in our series on domestication. This week we've talked about when we started domesticating animals and how it helped us and whether it helped us at all, actually, is what's coming up next. We're also going to talk about the downsides of domestication in general and the difference between that and taming. And just stick around. Make sure you subscribe for all of the Test 2 Plus episodes this week. And let's kick right into it. We've covered how domestication of certain animals has changed society. It's helped move us forward. Without domestication, we would not be the people that we are today, right? And it seems fitting then to talk about how plants and animals changed. We've talked about how we changed and how we got better. But what about animals? Did they also get better? The first farmers who switched from hunting and gathering into an agrarian or agricultural society, they aren't really thinking about if they take an animal out of the wild and they try and, you know, shear its wool or, you know, harvest its milk, what that's going to do to the animal, they're more thinking, I need this to survive, right? We can now, in hindsight, have 2020 and look back at those animals and see how we've changed them. They aren't really thinking about the future generations back then. Human physiology did change, like we talked about earlier. Skeletal evidence from Greece and Turkey show that the diet change affected our height. Skeletons from Greece and Turkey in the late Paleolithic era showed an average height of about 5'9 for men and 5'5 for women. And as agriculture came about and we started taking animals out of the wild and using them for our own purposes, Skeletal records show that what you would expect to be an increase was actually a decrease. Average height declined to 5'3 for men and 5 foot for women. But it wasn't just our height. When archaeologists studied 800 skeletons of Native American men and women near the Ohio and Illinois River Valleys, they found 50% had an increase in enamel defects because of agriculture, potentially, uh, compared to the hunter-gatherers who had preceded them. They also had huge rises in iron deficiency anemia, bone lesions, degenerative conditions of the spine. Agriculture changed fundamentally the animals that we pulled in, including ourselves. But initially it was Darwin who uh, pointed out the differences between wild ancestors of domesticated plants and modern plants, right? Darwin wrote, because, you know, who else is going to notice that? Darwin wrote on the origin of species, we shall thus see that a large amount of hereditary modification is at least possible, and what is equally or more important, we shall see how great is the power of man in accumulating by his selection successive slight variations. So let me translate that from Darwin speak, which is pretty crazy, right? Basically what he's saying is over time, we're going to see how humans change these animals. Generation to generation, we're going to select for things that nature might not have. And that's going to make these things change, slight variations successively over time. So whether inadvertently or purposefully, we've actually changed these animals forever. We've changed the phenotypes of plants forever over the course of their history. So for example, there is evidence that humans changed how often the mutation of a single gene in some wheat and barley plants would allow a seed pod to fall apart. Now let me explain what that means. This is complicated. But the mutation itself has the advantage for the plant of allowing the seeds to come out of the seed pod, right? However, we're harvesting wheat and barley. That mutation is good for the plant naturally, allows the seeds out, so they can germinate and create more wheat and barley, but we wanted to keep them together because we wanted those pods. So we kept the wheat and barley with that mutation alive, the ones that don't break their seed pods open, and over generations, we bred so many of the closed seed pod variety that now that's the norm, which is bad for wheat and barley, but good for humans. We've affected a lot of the world's plants in this and a variety of other ways. Researchers from the University of Maryland and the Georg August University of Göttingen, I don't know if I got any of that right, but I hope so, calculated species richness on Earth as a result of human alteration of native habitats. They calculated the anthropogenic species richness, ASR, as they called it, of over 16,000 different regions of the planet, and they found that we impacted 93% of the Earth's ice-free land area. 93% of the plants and animals and the species all across the earth have been affected by humans in some way. Animals are really the ones who've 
borne the brunt of a lot of this damage, as you can probably guess. Domesticated animals and their wild ancestors are vastly different in a number of ways because of our interference. In a paper out of the National Center for Biotechnology Information, researchers tried to identify specific genes in domestic animals that because of our influence are expressed differently than their wild ancestors. How they found this out was they looked at the mRNA sequencing to analyze a whole gene expression across the brain's frontal cortex. They specifically looked at dogs and wolves and pigs and wild boars and domesticated and wild rabbits to compare the three different animals, or six really. Their findings were interesting because they actually found some gene expression changes. These are gonna be complicated, but bear with us on this. The gene that is expressed most differently between dogs and wolves is TKTL1, or transketylase like one. So TKTL1 encodes an enzyme which helps in the process called aerobic glycolysis. Aerobic glycolysis has to do with how the body processes glucose in the presence of oxygen, and it's pretty complicated, but the increase is related to tumor growth or has been tied to it. So more aerobic glycolysis is usually associated with more tumors, we think. Um, we did a lot of research on this, and we had a lot of trouble getting a direct answer. So if there are any biologists checking out the podcast today, make sure you let us know. Wolves also expressed this gene. It's a gene we all know and love. Are you ready, everybody? AP5Z1, say it with me, KIAA0415, right? You guys, totally. They express that way more than dogs, and the gene, AP5Z1 slash KI whatever, carries proteins throughout the cell membrane. So wolves might be better at moving proteins around their bodies, and that means they don't need as much to survive. Either way, these things are on a fundamental genetic level, and we have changed these animals. We've changed their genes, and we did it over thousands of years. We didn't have CRISPR-Cas9 go in and cut out a piece of DNA and replace it with something else, we did this through breeding. The difference is it just took longer, right? So we're not gonna get into all of the different gene expression changes that they found because it's a lot of stuff, it's really complicated, we are not the best at molecular biology. However, super interesting, definitely check it out. For us as humans, we're much more interested in the behavior of these animals, right? The cellular level is important, but the behavior, the wider morphology and physiology of these animals has also been drastically changed and how that affects how we relate to those animals. Probably the most significant impact in a negative way of domestication on animals was brain size. After many generations of domestication, animals' behavior was changed through things like reduced wariness. They weren't as worried about the things around them. They weren't as reactive in that way. They had a low reactivity to external stimuli kind of across the board. It also took a toll on brain function and thus, because it wasn't being used as much, brain size. Now several studies have shown systematic brain size reduction in domesticated mammals versus their wild counterparts. A paper by senior research scientist and curator at the Smithsonian Institution, Dr. Melinda A. Zeter said that there's a positive correlation between brain mass of an animal and brain size reduction. So mammals with big brains had greater reduction in size of their brain when domesticated. Domestication equals smaller brains. I don't think I can put it any simpler than that. And pigs, they got it the worst. Poor little piggy brains have shrunk 33.6% compared to their wild ancestors. Turkeys suffered a 30% brain size reduction and other birds as well. Trout, rainbow trout specifically, uh, raised in captivity showed significant brain size reduction compared to wild counterparts. The largest brain reduction is not surprisingly the parts linked to things like aggression, reproduction, and feeding behavior. Three things that humans wanted to control. What's interesting is the amount of time that the animal has been domesticated is not necessarily conducive to the amount of reduction in size. Sheep have been domesticated for over 10,000 years and they show about a quarter brain size reduction, 24%. While a ferret has only been domesticated 2,500 years and showed a 30% brain size reduction. So maybe they don't correlate directly more research is obviously needed, but what we do know is that it seems that areas associated with the things that humans want to control do tend to shrink once we've domesticated those animals. 
We've also overbred dogs and other animals. There's way more dogs than there would be if they were wild. And the reason we did that is to fit our need. We would rarely be breeding these dogs for any other purposes except aesthetics at this point. And if you don't think that that damages a breed or a species, I don't even know like where to start. There are all sorts of problems when it comes to breeding an animal for our own entertainment. Selective breeding has created hundreds of dog breeds that deal with major health issues. And we've done this on purpose for the most part, and we continue to do it because we're breeding for physical characteristics that we enjoy. For example, the pug has large eyes and short little cute little legs, but it has problems breathing and it has problems with its bone structures because we bred it to look cute and it probably wouldn't have survived otherwise. Not great. The Chinese Shar Pei has extreme skin infections caused by the wrinkles that we like to look at, but they're not the best for keeping clean. Bulldogs and other breeds with flat faces, like pugs, also have breathing issues because their noses are set back slightly and generation after generation, we're breeding them for that flat face. So when we interbreed two dogs together, we're sort of like breeding cousins and they end up getting more and more set back, causing shortened air passages. Bloodhounds get irritated eyes and infections because we love those droopy little dog eyes and faces. Love them, not great for the dog. We're just doing it for ourselves. And those are just a few examples. I'm sure we can all think of some more. There are also immune system defects, blood disorders, neurological problems, behavioral problems, heart disease, cancer, birthing difficulty. It just goes on and on and on and all sorts of other problems. We did a whole video over on DNews about the white tiger, which is not a real thing. It's a mutation in tigers. So when you see two of them, chances are they're related. The question I sort of have for you guys is, why do we do this to animals? that we tame and domesticate. What are we doing? Why are we doing this? Also, what's the difference between taming and domesticating? <laughs> For that, you're gonna have to come back tomorrow. But let us know down in the comments how you feel about our kind of taking these animals and doing what we will with them. But make sure you subscribe and come back tomorrow where we're gonna learn the difference between domestication of animals and taming of animals. Believe me, it's super interesting. It involves like behavioral psychology and the difference in genetics. It's gonna be really fun. It's gonna be really cool. So make sure you come back for that and I'll see you tomorrow.